Yeah. Just three days after this accused shooter shot a little boy, he walks free, making bond on Tuesday. It has this family angry and confused. And I'm trying to figure out how he got a bond that was so low for trying to kill my kids. Arnold Daniel trying to figure out why Ryan Lee Wen is out of jail after allegedly shooting his son, Kobe. He said he was a sledgehammer, but that's not going to work him too fast. So then what did he do? Got a gun. Boom. Shot me right here. It's all on video Saturday afternoon on Candlewood Lane. You'll see kids playing, hear a gunshot, then Kobe realizes he's hit. <laughs> Lee Wen allegedly fired through his front window. The bullet went in Kobe's arm and out the other side. Did it hurt? Yes. You point to it? Show us where it's at. No, it didn't hurt. It's right now, he's not even processing exactly what happened. You know, he don't realize you know, don't how pain, like, close he came to things. not being here. Um, but I realize it. 29-year-old Lee Wen is charged with assault with intent to murder. He's apparently had issues with neighbors in the past. And this time, Dad Arnold so suspects Lee Wen was mad. Kobe's bike was in his yard. I'm irate, really. I mean, I can't. I can't function and I don't know what to do. A Washtenaw County judge gave him a $10,000 cash bond, which he made to Ask me. This is him walking <laughs> ooh, out ooh, I know, I know. Family. The prosecutor's office shocked at the low bond. They're filing an emergency motion to get it changed. A judge's order not to return home, but it's a piece of paper, says Arnold. I'm scared for my family, you know, but I, I'm scared for them because I don't know what he's capable of. Reporting you yeah, Jessica now you know. Knapp, Fox now you know. 2 News. <sighs> okay, so. No, I don't want to hear another. No, thank you. Um, stop Asian hate. Um, where are y'all? Here's the deal, this is your problem. This is your problem as Asian people. And what I wanna to say to people who are not Asian is that one of the worst things we could probably do is call them the Asian community because Asians are not a community. I mean, if you're talking Asia, it's a whole continent of people who live, think, breathe differently, extremely diverse, almost as diverse as Africa, huge, okay? Islands, land masses, huge. Um, Vietnamese, right? You know, me and my Seattle, I come from Seattle, Rainier Valley, where over 66 national languages are spoken and so many of those are Asian people. I come from the city where the largest Asian Muslim community resides. Grew up with Asians. Closest friend is always Asian or biracial. So, having come up in Asian homes, I feel like I'm the best person to say that Asians truly have a hatred problem when it comes to Black people. And um, because they don't have the guilt of slavery, like because they haven't enslaved us or, you know, that kind of thing. They don't hold back. White people have guilt, have this thing where they're like, oh, you poor little, little negra, how can I help them? I'm just so sad, you know, like, like they don't have those inhibitions. They don't have a relationship to you and your history and the things that you've been through. I mean, maybe a few Asians who are like, some Asians qualify closer to black than they do to white. Like, I wanna tell you guys something about, um, Something I learned about the Cham community. I'm about to roast you, niggas. <laughs> the Cham community, and I don't give. Come find me. I, I I don't I don't give. Tell me I'm lying though. Be before you have a problem, Cham Cambodia, Champa Vietnam. 
Angkor Wat. Tell me I'm lying. Y'all are some of the most racist people alive. And not just racist, right? Because y'all don't really have a big problem with Arabs. Y'all don't have a real big problem with white people. Y'all are gangsters out here, especially Chan Cambodian people. And y'all don't have a real problem with the Latinx community. But as much as you appropriate black culture, as much as y'all are the break dancing, his crip walking, his blood crips all up and down California, y'all are anti-black. I remember being a part of the Chad Masjid in uh, South Seattle. And I mean, these Asians would be like, why are you in our mosque? It ain't a black mosque somewhere you can go to. Ain't it a Somali mosque somewhere? There's one down the street. Why don't you go pray there? So before you chams get mad at me, tell me I'm lying. Imam Abdubari, Farid, <laughs> Rakaya's wife, tell me I'm lying. A husband, tell me I'm lying. Tell me I'm lying. Y'all got a race problem. And it's not just with black people, it's just worse, worse with black people because quiet as it's kept, Chom people have, have a problem with each other. You have Champa, Vietnam, you have Cham, uh, Cambodia. The Cambodians are, are, are the inwards of, you know, the Cham community. And the Vietnamese are closer to white, even if you look at their faces. You look at their faces. I had a very close friend, um, Rukaya. Um, I was about to call her by a nickname, but she hates it. Um, when you see her in her hijab, you don't really see an Asian. She has a very diverse look. She almost looks like an auto, right? Um, beautiful woman, beautiful, you know, but she comes from like, I think the blacker chums and her husband, um, Farid, he comes from the whiter ones, like the Vietnamese like type. And I think, um, I don't know if it's the same with Abdul Bari or not, but um, I had Abdul Rahman as a student. And uh, now that I'm no longer a teacher, I can say that um, my chum boys, um, Anas and um, Abdul Rahman, um, they, were, they were some of my favorite kids, but again, second graders, so they're kids. This is me teaching at an Asian Islamic school that can float, can hold its own weight without the Somali community, but they think that they're superior to them because they're African. Before you get upset, <laughs> tell me I'm lying. That's why your school tanked. We, we, had, we had a problem with that. Black people did, not those mixed black people you guys put in power, but you know, we did, my color, we did. Um, some of the most racist people I ever seen in my life. I remember the first time when I was in the masjid and I heard Farid's sister basically going off about how many Africans were in the mosque. I was shocked because Farid is like, you see him on these Da'awa circuits. He's kind of a local celebrity, yada, 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 you know? And I was just like, how can that be his sister? Cause this man's not racist. Like this man, you know, he married a Somali woman. Like, what is the deal? Why are you like this? But um, it's a cultural thing. And there was, um, crap, I'm forgetting her name. It's been so long since I've been willing to deal with the Muslim community for obvious reasons, because the Muslims in general are anti-black. I said it. Um, even a lot of African Muslims, like, like they say dumb stuff, like why get with a black girl when you can get with a Somali girl? <laughs> Sis, do you know what you are? <laughs> Whatever. You'll learn. Um, anyhow, what was her name? Rabia? It's not Rukhaya, it's not Rabia, but there is a chum sister who <sighs> one of the best women I've ever seen in my life. Older charm sister, she's got a son. She would keep her son constantly in the masjid, learning Quran and, and a hadith, um, always, always with a ma'alim somewhere, always with a teacher. And she was just like, do you, she got up. God, I'm gonna cry, okay? <laughs> it's like Ramadan, right? Ramadan's not a holy month, the way people call it among Muslims, but it's noble as, it's noble AF, all right? 
what was her name? Like she was homies with all the Africans. It was like me, Hania. Um, she got up, she stood up in front of the sister side of the masjid and she was like, do you hear what they're saying? They're saying you people are dirty and you shouldn't be here. And that's wrong for them to say. Stalk for law, you know, they, they, they shouldn't, they, I'd seek God's forgiveness and correction, uh, go back to the way your creator would have you, have you to be. Um, Estelle for the law. She, and she began to translate for us. This one tiny little uh, Cham woman who was like, again, there's the Vietnamese and there, there's a Cham Vietnamese and there's a Cham Cambodian. The Vietnamese, they're the white people of the Cham people and the, uh, which is, you know, a Vietnamese shot this little black boy. I'm going to make a point. Um, and um, the Cham people were uh, railroaded, discriminated against. I mean, just just war, like, like uh, Vietnamese people. I mean, that's why they're refugees, right? War, seeking refuge from the Vietnamese. So um, on one hand, it's the Cham Refugee Center, and then the masjid is also called something of, of like a prayer center. And I wrote all over the wall. I was like, if this is the Cham Refugee Center, let us know we will not come back. If this is a masjid, if this is the house of Allah, then we will be here and we will pray. Khalas, or enough, it is finished. Um, and what was crazy is that the women who would stay and clean that masjid and when their food would be rotting and things like this, it would be me and a ton of East Africans. Me and a ton of East Africans. When it needed to be cleaned, if there was freaking roaches and we raised $500 among us, everybody was this hair color. We were good to that masjid and we were good to the people there. We were good to the students that we uh, accumulated, whatever Islamic school popped up and dropped down like we taught at it. And we... We were kind, we were decent, uh, we were we were dutiful, we were devoted um, to the community of Muslims because we were like, you know, okay, well, we're, 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 the, we're, like, we're, like, we're the brotherhood of Muslims. So we would try to put Islam first, whereas like, I think it was a style of the law, he, I don't, and I don't give two shits about saying names, like, like, here's the deal. Some, some of the best and worst experiences I've ever had in my life are with uh, Muslims and, um, so if you, I don't wear hijab, I do this, I do that, yeah. Um, experiences. I don't know if it was a stud, Abdullah Hijaranao, or who, who was trying to call the Adhan in an Asian man, a Vietnamese man, uh, pulled him by his clothes and was like, no. <laughs> who are you? The, the, you? You can't go call the Adhan at Abu Bakr, why are you here? And it's strange because the very first person to ever give the call to prayer in, in Islam, right? So we have, it's a very Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Asharun Layla, Hilalah, Asharun Layla, Hilalah, Asharun Muhammad Rasulullah, Asharun Muhammad Rasulullah, Hay ala Salah, Hay ala Salah, Hay ala Falah, Hay ala Falah. If it's morning, Asalatu Khairun Minan Noam. Salatu khairan minan noam, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. The very first person in Islamic history to do that was a former slave named Bilal ibn Rabah, right? Black guy, <laughs> super African, super like, like, like this black, not this black, this black. So you would think with you know the prophet muhammad ibn abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa with all his final addresses and he's like you know no arab has a superiority over non-arab no black has superiority over white yada 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 like he would make these comments about sexism and racism um like in his farewell address to make sure people didn't you know he's like protect the woman protect the prayer <sighs> protect the women protect the prayer um And these people are still racist. And a lot of these people, they can't work the racism out of their bodies. So some people, when they're saying stop Asian hate, they feel entitled to the, the you know, 
the bodies and the activism and whatever of black people, but it's not something that they return. Now I can tell you from growing up with Vietnamese people that these people are MF and hardcore. These people will shoot you and, 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 and bathe their kids at night, make the prayer and not feel nothing about it and not feel nothing about it. Right? Like even like my cousins who are half Korean, like, like, like they're military, like, like keep it a buck. Like, like they're the same way. Like th there's some violations that Asians were just cold, cold. Some violations is just worthy of death. And it's like, all right, then what? And um, part of that, I would say is a good attribute. And I would say this in return to the Vietnamese community, you know, like I know. That man who shot that six year old, you know, like I know what he deserves and you know, like I know. I mean, he here's the deal, black people, right? Because some of you have such are, are so. Some of you are so eager to live and be around non black people. And those of us who have those experiences do what I did and move to the blackest freaking place that they can find because we know what's going on. Reverse the situation. Make that little boy Vietnamese, which is obviously hard for me because, again, uh, one of my my probably my most beloved students was uh, a little Chong boy. Okay, anyhow, um, make it a black man who shot that kid, and um, a little Vietnamese six year old. There would be black men popping up dead who didn't do nothing. Coming up missing, coming up with holes in them, and like, like, look, did we get him? Not nope, that was his brother. I don't care. Did we get him? Not nope, that was his cousin. Did we get him? Not nope, that was his daddy. Was that really his daddy? Or did, no, that was his mom's new husband. Did we get him? You, you would be out of there. It wouldn't be no crying to the news. I don't know what these Negroes are capable of. There would, there would, there would be none of that. It would be shoot them up, bang, bang. Or a thorough Muay Thai beatdown. We have uh, street fighters where I'm from, right? Um, one of the board members uh, at a school that I used to work at, uh, an Islamic school, uh, Hamza. Um, a bunch of these men were 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 taught how to street fight by like a, I don't know, like a biracial black man. Um, I, I don't think I've ever seen a group of Asians so gangster, so thoroughly gangster <laughs> than uh, Cham Vietnam and Cham, uh, Cham Vietnamese and Cham uh, Cambodian people. Like when I say these people will F you up, I'm not surprised that this grown 20 something year old man first came after this little black boy with a sledgehammer. I'm not. Because I come from one of these communities where Asians are not a minority, where Asians get to throw their weight around. So was one of the best friends I've ever had, one of these Asians? Yes. Was one of the best imams I've ever known, one of these Asians? Yes. Um, was one of my favorite students, one of these Asians? Yes. Was I beloved to a number of these Asians? Yes. But I was just the big black unicorn. Like they might like you, we like you chocolate, but the people who look like you, we don't want them to pray next to us. We don't want them in our mosque. We don't want them parking in our parking lot. Don't want to be nowhere near you. Don't want their kids, to, like, like not, none of it.
that man who shot that six-year-old deserves the same bullet. Black people are afraid to say that stuff out loud because we are so intellectually molested and conquered <laughs> by white supremacy. We've been in the belly of the beast of, of you know, racism, white supremacy for too long. But it would be nothing for uh, a Cham Cambodian man or a Cham Vietnamese to be like, you know, like them men would come to school strapped up, gym teacher strapped up. Uh, 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 administrators strapped up, board members strapped up. Like, <laughs> we got our second graders, our third graders, fourth graders, we got the middle school kids, we got the gym teacher <laughs> uh, strapped. I mean, I want to say hood, Iggas, but like uh, my YouTube channel, you know, monetization, some words you just can't say, but um. These dudes thugging out here. The women are thugging. <laughs> the women will jack you up. I used to tell people, I said this a year ago on my channel when people were talking about how mm, 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 African-American women are. I was like, yo, my area code is 206. You ain't never been cussed out. I remember Heidi from Sunlight Salon, bro. You ain't never been cussed out in you, until you have been cussed out by a Vietnamese female owner of a salon, bro. Cussed up and down. <laughs> up and down. But you guys are like, oh, Asian women so docile, so submissive because you don't know any except for those who are willing to do what they got to do to get to this country for obvious reasons. I said what I said. Um, my Korean aunt was very good to me. And I think she has, um, at least until I got my DNA done and I found all the Sri Lanka and Chinese Thai and, and, and Indonesian and whatever uh, in my lineage that had nothing to do with it. I always credited my, my aunt Kim for why I came out such a pseudo Asian and how I just gravitated to Asian people. And um, what was her name? I'm gonna text her because you. Where's she at? I'm a John. I'm laughing because uh, the only white guy I have saved in my phone, I haven't saved as the N-word. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm petty. Rookie, yeah. This is going to freak her out, me coming out of nowhere. It's like, what's the name of the, what's the name? That's tacky. That's Rahmah, 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 What's the name of the charm sister? Who would be in the mystic all the time with her son? And listen to how I'm about to describe her who was nice to the East Africans. I mean, these people literally like didn't even want to pray next to us. Like, like we could be doing itikaf, church people, that's like a shut-in. We could be doing itikaf. They would come in and throw our blankets, throw our like prayer mats, like whatever it was. Um, disrespect, like, like, why are you here? Um, 
Okay, rookie's online. Um, near Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr. Masjid. If you ask any uh, Vietnamese person if the tables were turned, they would be like, yeah, that guy deserves a bullet. And anybody who's honest, you know, because they're, like I said, you know, there are some Chum people, they marry black, you know, they're so black and they're so gangster and they're so whatever, they like big butts and they cannot lie. Um, they would be like, yeah, that guy deserves a bullet. So when you get off $10,000 for attempted murder, like it's clearly attempted murder because one, you came after the little boy with a sledgehammer. And then two, with a gun, shooting him through your window. Oh, and, and, and you got you met your target. And if it was attempted murder, then it's just like, okay, well, life for life. Simple. This man should be made an example of. For every, for, for everybody, every non-black person who has the gall to try to kill one of our kids. It's not, I don't understand and I'm on the phone and I don't understand why these people get to, nah. If Pookie and Ray Ray are good for anything, if they're good for anything, And here's the deal, when you're black, people are like, oh, well, what about forgiveness? Oh, well, what about unity? And I'm just like, we don't have the anti-unity problem. We want to be friends with everybody. People, y'all y'all don't want to be friends with us. And here's the deal. Here's what I learned from the Muslim community in Seattle. I was a little bit of a local celebrity. I did a lot of, like, I went to school with a lot of uh, these different Asian Muslims, so they knew I was a cheerleader and a dancer and a this and a that and a poet and a this and all these da'wa things, whatever. So I was very popular and I had that kind of reputation to perceive me. But Muslims, Asians, they do not like black people unless they are celebrities. I watched a whole bunch of uh, Asian people try to claim the hell out of Naomi Osaka, right? Her mom's Japanese or dad's Haitian. And they're like, oh, look at her character. That's Asian. Oh, look how kind, how noble, how humble. That's Asian. Oh, look how genuine and how, how whatever. That's Asian. And I'm like, if Naomi, if Naomi Osaka didn't beat Serena, you wouldn't even, you, you wouldn't like her. You would call her names like like um, this little this little uh, half Vietnamese boy. Uh, his family calls him the black one, the the little black one. Um, just all kind of social problems because of being mixed, right? It's part of the reason why mixed people come up so hurt in the head. Because most people identify with their mom. Uh, just uh, just keep it a buck. You know, in Islam, the lineage comes through the dad. So whatever the dad is, you just identify with that because you end up with his name, blah, 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 until you die. So when women get married, they don't lose their dad's name. You are always your father's daughter in Islam. Um, unless, of course, you're some kind of a bastard or, you know, there are, there are caveats, obviously. Um, that's not the only one, but I don't want to make this like a lecture. Uh, aimed once in my life to be a sheikha and uh, not anymore. Um, they don't honor uh, the, the mixed people among them. They, they end up getting shoved over to the black side. So when you see these Cham women who marry these African-American guys, for example, they end up getting shoved into the African-American guy's family because their black kids are looked down upon. Now if their black kid becomes, you know, Naomi Osaka, then all of a sudden it's like, ooh, 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 see, we're, we're so Asian and we're so there and that's why she's so good and that's why, that's why, that's why. And I'm like, her Haitian daddy taught her how to play like Serena's black daddy taught her how to play. Keep it a buck.
Japanese women are so desired and so pretty because you're this big. You're tiny, you're small, you're feminine. Even sometimes the men are effeminate. I mean, one, two, three, BTS, right? So when you want to call everybody else big and masculine and ugly, all right. Japan, Japanese heritage. Her Japanese mother, I would say, got her there, but Japanese heritage did not get Naomi Osaka to where she is. Because if that was the case, there would be more Japanese women on that level, and there's not. And the DNA of Naomi Osaka is the liberating, Orisha worshiping, freedom fighting spirit of the very first enslaved people from the transatlantic slave trade that ever became an independent nation. That's in her blood, that's in her body, that fight. Um, I have seen African-Americans, my, myself included, I mean, because I might have had a name at home, but there are definitely places I went to where I didn't know anybody. Let's say I went to Pittsburgh and I was praying with nothing but Arab women. And the Islamic prayer is shoulder to shoulder and slit to slit. Or, you know, it, it's a broken chain. And um, there's a hadith that says Allah does not look at a crooked line. So it's important to straighten your lines when you pray. And these women were like, I don't give up. Don't touch me. You're black. Inward. Abida. Get, get off. And I remember even some of these people would treat, treat me this way and then I would be like scheduled to do some kind of a spoken word or something. And after being on stage and proving that I had a talent and being popular or whatever, else, then people would be nice. But um, I remember when Lone converted to Islam. Lone is every African-American male Muslim. They're all really practicing, really soft-spoken, really very religious um, in general. But if Lone didn't deal with Diddy, People, people would be running away from him in the, in the prayer too. He would have to be chasing people's foot, just trying to, you know, keep protect the prayer. And it's just like, nah. But because, you know, I need a girl to ride, 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 you know. He packs out houses and people want to hear him speak. I'm like, all right, well, when he went back into jail, where were you? Where were you? Look, it doesn't matter. All I'm saying is that... um. African-American people can be violent, but truly in our culture, we don't have a hatred problem with anybody. We're not anti-white. We're not anti-Asian. We're not anti-Arab. We don't have a history of that. And we're one of the only groups of people on the planet who, who don't have a history of that. There are Africans who have a history of being anti this person and that person. There are Africans who have a history of being Af anti African American. Oh my God, when I found out the shade room was made by Nigerians, I was like, it figures because they're always in our business trying to find a way to denigrate us. Always. It's, it's always a Nigerian. I mean, a Ghanaian just might not care. A Sierra Leonean might just be, ah, I don't got time for that. Cote d'Ivoire, like whatever it is, Angola, like, like, you know, but, but something about a Nigerian, like they're constantly in the business of African-Americans, denigrating African-Americans, claiming the ingenuity of African-Americans. And I'm just like, oh, the shade on half figures. Uh, that makes sense to me. Um, but most Asians I have ever met in my life, and I have met many, 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 again, I come from a community where there are over 66 national languages spoken. And most of that is because of Asians. Go look at Rainer Valley. Go look at South Seattle. Anti-Black. That kid meant nothing to that man. And that man is is every Asian man USA. He ain't no different than, he, he's Ronnie, Bobby, Ricky, and Mike. He, his name might as well be John, Joshua. Like, you know how John and whatever is a normal name? John, Jacob, his name's my name too. He, he's, he's every dude, bro. He's not outside of his, you know, mind. Like, I remember there used to be this uh, homeless Chong guy who, you know, people would just give him food and, you know, 
he was actually swagged up for, for a homeless dude. Uh, he was different, obviously different in the head because there's something about being homeless in America that drives you crazy. But that guy who shot that little boy, he wasn't crazy. Ain't, ain't nothing wrong with that guy. It's just black lives don't matter. It's especially to some of these Vietnamese people out here. You can address Asians as a community. Oh, the Asian community is like, what the hell? They don't identify as a community. Sit a, a, a child person down with a, with a Laotian and then you'll see. Laos, Vietnam, put them together, see what happens. A lot of uh, Laotian people, they're, they're blacker Asians. Filipinos, they're like the Hispanics of Asians. They're blacker Asians. They got, you know, Buffalo Soldier, Dreadlock Rastas in there in their past. The Temple of Angkor Wat. So when I say that the Chan Cambodian people were discriminated against and um, terrorized by uh, the Vietnamese Chan people, Angkor Wat, it's alleged that it was built by black people, black Asians. When you go far enough back in their lineage, you, you find Negroids is what it is. Um, honestly, the the Cham Vietnamese and Cham um, Cambodian issue reminded me a lot of the Hutu and Tutsi in Rwanda, because in Rwanda, what you have with the Hutu and Tutsi, like King Leopold, um, he looked at the people and separated them based on who had features closer to white people and basically destabilized the power balance by uh, empowering people who were not empowered before. So of course there's a loss of resources and that kind of thing. But when you're looking at uh, Cham Vietnam and Cham Cambodia, the Cham Vietnam people are whiter in appearance. They're whiter in appearance like literally paler skin. Um, a lot of Cham Cambodians, like you look at their noses and it's just like, you, you see this, you know, it, it's like some, it look like Negro noses, it'd be big Negro lips, beautiful people, be gorgeous. Um, but just because you're pretty doesn't mean that that's not a sign of, oh, you're inferior because you're blacker. So they have this problem among themselves, let alone with Negroes. And it's okay in their community. It's okay. Um, and because I was such a beloved unicorn, I got to hear a lot of that stuff. Some of that hatred turned me out. And when I say turned me out, I mean, I don't think I'll ever pray outside of my home again. I don't think I will ever experience Ramadan in a masjid again. I don't think I will ever say Islam alaikum to a Muslim in public unless it's somebody I already know. Like I will not, there, there's nothing, I, I will no longer integrate myself with the Muslim community at large because the Muslim community at large is anti-racist. And it includes all nations of people. I mean, excuse me, anti-black. So, this Vietnamese guy who shot this little six-year-old, he doesn't have to be Muslim. The point is, I am sharing my life experience growing up with Asian people. Growing up uh, as a kid who used to go to the Puyallup Fairgrounds where the Japanese internment was, um, as a person who took two years of Japanese, you know, Kori Kumasaka was my counselor at Franklin High School, just having this, this love for Asian people. They love me back, but I had a love for the people. And that wasn't equal anywhere I ever went. Like, like I had a love and an, adm the, and an admiration for the people, and for the culture, for the families, and for the history, and for the struggle. And I would learn about these things because it meant something to me. And I was this Puff the Magic Negro, like, we like you, but, you know, at them, at them niggas, you know? It's how they feel. Um, and it's the same thing with East Africans, whoever else. Like, I mean, I mean, when you get close enough to people, they will tell you. 
they, they will tell you straight up. There are places I could go that my mom couldn't. The same people who like me would see my mom and look upside her head and just like, yo, that's blood. What are you doing? Oh, I didn't know it was your mom. You didn't, you shouldn't have had to. There's no way I'm going to look at a random Somali woman or a random Asian woman. It's just automatically be hateful because I don't know who that person is. But that's how you feel about black people. So you just automatically switched to hate. Here's the deal. And here's the authenticity of being an ally. No matter what, and I do mean no matter what. It's so funny in my head, it's like nandeska, right? What in Japanese. No matter what an Asian person does, I'm always going to empathize with right and wrong. I'm, I'm always, the black women have a very, very thick moral compass. Not all of us, many of us. So when this little boy gets shot in his arm by an Asian man, I still lose my bearings when I think of the persecution of Uyghur Muslims in China. When this Vietnamese man shoots my little, you know, nephew, six-year-old boy, uh, comes after him with a sledgehammer, I still feel in my soul uh, the same amount of pain that I saw when, uh, or I felt when I saw uh, footage of a bunch of Buddhist soldiers looking for a Rohingya girl in Myanmar, Burma. Um, the soldiers were calling her by name because they had been raping her for weeks, running trains on her for weeks. So they would go like straight up to her parents, emasculate her dad, like, yo, where is she? We need that, we want that. When you're an actual ally, nothing can erase. Because you're not an ally necessarily of the people, you're an ally of the principle. What's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And sometimes it hurts, especially as a black woman, because you almost want to hate back, but you are a freaking mother earth and there's nothing you can do about it. You almost want to be like, all right, but you can't turn it off. Life can suck when you see the humanity in people who don't see it in you. Life can really suck when you see the humanity in people. I'm telling you that Vietnamese man sees no humanity in that little black boy. And obviously the people who let him off for $10,000 don't see the humanity in him either. Obviously. And any Vietnamese person who's half honest, who, who just just half, doesn't have to be the most virtuous, I mean, like, no, just, just half honest will tell you, yeah. We think black people are animals. I had a friend, um, we called him James Chan, but his name was actually Saw You uh, when I was in high school, uh, Franklin. And I was like, James, what's the word for African-American in Chinese? He goes, hmm? And I'm like, yeah, like, what's the word? I want to write it down. And he was just like, nothing. And I'm like, James, nothing? He was like, no, we just call you monkeys. That's all we got. When they, when they really put you, when they like <clears throat> put you, they'll tell you straight up. So what was cool about that is that when I landed in Hong Kong, I, I, I knew how to work. I, I knew how to rock. I, I knew what it was because he empowered me with knowledge and he told me the truth. So I'm telling you the truth. You can call it spreading hate, whatever you want. Like, I, oh, I, I do not care because I lived this life for so many years. Like a lot of times they hate you unless you're a celebrity. And what I mean by hate is not this devilish blah, blah, blah. I mean, just strong dislike and, and an aversion to an indifference. Live or die, they don't care. Just don't. It ain't, it ain't a, 
I was about to say the Vietnamese person no way that flinched over that little boy that I'd be lying. My Rokaya probably flinched. Um, my, um, I want to call her Rabia so bad, but that's not her name. I'm sure she would like cry and pray, but I'm saying the average person because like there's a difference between African Americans and other people because the average one of us is not raised, is not taught, does not have hatred in their heart. We're actually mesquine in the heart. Mesquine, like, um, I talk about Muslims and I speak Arabic. It's, it's like poor you, like, like, like soft hearted people. We love everybody. We're soft to everybody. We're interracial as heck, you know, because we know what it is to be hated. We know more than anybody on earth what it is to be hated. just for what you are, not how you are, not how you interact, but just for what you are. So we in turn shoot out the most kind of love, you know? Um, so I say that this is a Vietnamese problem because there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, I was about to say, there's a lot of Vietnamese people who are mixing with black people, blah, 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 in the same neighborhoods, businesses, whatever. And even then, even then, it's like, there's a reason they don't mind jacking you up at their nail shops. I just watched a video the other day of a black girl, little black girl, trembling. She wasn't no big Amazon like me. She might've been like five, five, 110 pounds trembling and there is another black woman you know defending her against the people who own the store and they, she was like yo if you don't want black people in your store don't sell black products solve your problem solve your issue i don't know what the problem is why are you selling stuff to us but you want you want our ass every time we walk in here your si your s-h-i-t-t-y every time we come in here what 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 is the deal stop but my thing is they already showed you they already told you the video that I'm talking about actually happened in my hood. Like it, it happened where like, I'm like, I'm from the central district of Seattle. My family got pushed out through gentrification all the way to Tacoma. And this happened in Tacoma, Washington. The story where this little bony black girl is like trembling, you know, because the store owner thinks she stole something and she has the receipts. Like I just bought this. And you have all the other stories where they're like caving black girls head in as grown Asian men beating the heck out of African-American women. I'm just like, catch the, dig the hint. I'm a bit of a strange black girl. I'm a bit of an off brand black girl. I'm a little bit abnormal for everybody. So there are people who see me and I break the, their rules of how they deal with an African-American. Um, but I'm still going to come back to African-Americans with a report. This is your rapport among so many people, especially immigrants or refugees who come here and learn to assimilate and they learn that the type of American to be like is the white American and the type of, um, of like you are failed if you are like this kind of American and not type of American. And the, the, the existence of Jay-Z doesn't matter. The existence of Beyonce, the existence of, of, of Obama's not African American. The existence of Michelle Obama, it doesn't matter. Just, just as a group, if you're anything like them, you have failed. If you deal with them, if you mix with them, you have failed. This is what they are taught. African-Americans, you're still two thirds of a human being. You're still half a human. Excuse me, that's not half. Excuse me, it's not two thirds, it's three eighths of a human being. You're still three eighths of a human being to a lot of these people. To a lot of these people. It hasn't changed and everybody's like, oh, what happened 400 years ago? We got our civil rights in 1968. My mother was alive when Dr. King was assassinated. What do you mean a long time ago? What do you mean ancestors, nigga? Do you mean my grandma? Hmm? <laughs> the guy needs a bullet. The least it could be is also in his arm. That guy needs a bullet in his arm or in his head. 
period. That's justice. A oh, damn ten thousand dollars. What, what, what the hell is that paid to the state? What is the kid award of the state? You did something to a family. You trying to tell me a family doesn't have a right to recompense? Go ask a Vietnamese person that. See what they say. Yeah, so if one of your little uh, kids was playing in my yard and I chased him with a sledgehammer and he was too fast for me to catch, so the next time I saw him, I shot him, What would? What, how would you punish you? See what they say. So with all the anti-blackness that I have seen firsthand with Asian communities, Muslim communities, all non-African American communities, because even quiet as it's kept, so even some Caribbeans, certain Caribbean communities, like like African Americans just have it hard. Everybody takes from us, takes our culture, says our sh but doesn't respect us, doesn't like us to our face. They're not even scared to. They're not even scared to shoot your kids because People are afraid to harm a white woman. They know she can't fight. They know they could beat her up. They know that they outweigh her. <laughs> they know they can slap Karen. Even black police officers are afraid to apprehend, you know, Lilibet, I don't know, uh, 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 Karen. They're, they're afraid because they know her life is worth something. I don't know who told these people to say black lives matter, but it kind of makes me think, I mean, no wonder it's controlled opposition. It's a, it's a crap organization. It's controlled opposition, it's owned by a white supremacist, George Soros. Hey, how you doing? It, it's it's nonsense. But I mean, crying to the news is not enough. Calling somebody on the phone is not enough. Is this hate speech? What was it when he shot that little boy? What was it when he came after him with a sledgehammer? That was, he should have got his, he should have got jumped by every black man in that community when he came after that little boy with a sledgehammer. That was the day they should have broken his home and beat him unconscious. Hands off our kids, period. Everybody expects African-Americans to forgive, but what if we, what if we shot your kids? Would you forgive us? cold-blooded that that man got off with $10,000 bond. People have to pay more than that for, <laughs> for lesser offenses. It's attempted murder of a child. But the child is black, so it doesn't matter. They think we're racist when we say stuff like, hurry up and bye. Hurry up and bye. You know why we say that stuff? Because that's what y'all do. Y'all take over the hood. Y'all ask us for our money, then kick us out of the store. And y'all tell us to hurry up and buy, and you follow us around the store. Like we're stealing from you. And here's the deal. They don't see the nuances of African Americans. They can't tell, you know, the really sweet girl from the really bad girl, from the prostitute, from the school teacher, from the. Mm -mm. It's just ngas, <laughs> all of them. Again, I'm a unicorn. I don't count. All the wonderful, beautiful experiences I've had, I've come to understand that I don't count because my experiences are not normal. They're not normal. How many African American girls? I, I can't count how many lingo, especially born in the 80s. I don't, I don't know an African American girl who lived in as many Asian homes as I have, who has been beloved and adopted by as many Asian families as I have, who has been welcomed into as many Asian spaces as I have. I, I, I don't know another one. And because I'm the exception to the rule, the rule remains. Because I'm the exception to the rule, the rule remains. 
I don't break the rule. I, I wish I could. These people are so anti-black, they have no mercy on a child. And you know, it's not just Asians. I mean, you guys see it, you know, Michael Vick. <laughs> Michael Vick was fighting them dogs. <laughs> they were like, put that naker under the jail. <laughs> and here's the deal. I was such a little black, white girl. I used to kiss my dogs in the mouth, okay? I, I had to I had to grow out of that. That's nasty. Don't do that. Um but I was one of them. I had it so bad white people would look at me like that's nasty. Um Michael Vick can't fight a dog without white people and all people losing their ish. And hear me out because I think dog fighting is wrong. I am a dog lover. You can't fight dogs, but you can't shoot an African American six year old. Think about it. Look at the look at the difference in outrage. Take care of it, Dad. You know who did it, and you know where he lives. You can figure it. You can figure it out. Figure it out. Don't get caught. You don't have no business. You have no business pulling out a gun on kindergartners. I didn't have one African American student when I taught at um, these different Islamic schools all over the world. I didn't have one African American student. But I remember, I decided to quit my job at the last Islamic school that I worked at because I wanted. I wanted to go toe to toe with the principal because of the way she treated one of my students. Like, like get them up. Like if I, if I see her today, like I don't, I don't even want to see anybody in Seattle anymore. Like if, if I saw her today, I would want to fight her today. And you know, it's a big deal with Muslims because we're not supposed to hurt each other. Blue, 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 blue. Because of the way that she would treat some of my students. How do, you, how do you not love a child that much? They're, they're kids, they're innocent. I, I couldn't help how much I love my students. They were mine. They were mine, they're kids, they're beautiful, they're innocent. And my kids were like seven and eight. If it came down to me and Abdurrahman, my uh, child student, and there was a gunman, I would have taken the bullet for him. That's not my son, he's not my race, he's my student and he's a child and it's enough. It's, it's enough. I'm telling you, these people don't have that kind of humanity in their hearts. They don't have it. I don't know why it's not there. Hoteps talk about melanin and the thi the thymus gland, not thyroid, the thymus gland and how it yields tenderness and humanity and compassion and how it gets callous in white people. May maybe there's something about that and, and, and the next group of people it gets callous in is, is Asian people. Maybe there's something to it. I don't know. Some of this melanin stuff I think is just black people stroking their little egos. And on the other hand, I'm just like, why does it exist in your heart? How come you're not this hurt? There's nothing I want to do for any of my students. They weren't my kid. They weren't African American and they didn't have to be. I had um I had a little half chime, a half uh, Chinese girl named Sumaya. And she came and she said, my kids would touch the crap out of me. And I would I would tell them to stop, like, you know, I'm a teacher, but they were just like, F that ish. Like they would accidentally call me mom, play in my hijab, and, the, and she was afraid of Donald Trump. And I was like, Sumaya, 
But you're Chinese. Who are you afraid of? And she's like, huh? And I lectured her in front of the class because I wanted the class to appreciate her heritage as well because we had, you know, a lot of East Africans, Asians, like it was it was too big of a cultural opportunity not to build, you know, solidarity and, and cultural competence. But I started to lecture her about the history of China and I'm just like, China is, is bad ASS, so man, you don't you're not afraid of anybody. And um her mom came to me the next day and she was like, um, it was almost like she was crying. She was just like, you made her proud. There's not an Asian teacher anywhere who would do for a black student what I did for my Asian student. My heart isn't made up that way. My, my love doesn't know a color. Sometimes I wish it did because I get angry and bitter. Not the shape of my heart. But I did for her what I would have done for any of my students. And I didn't let her leave the front of my classroom until she knew what she was. Like you, you have all kinds of reasons to be proud and to be bold and to like, like you have a whole a legacy of ASS kicking when it comes to the US and all their foreign policy and all that like girl, mm-mm. <laughs> not you 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 of all all the students in my class <laughs> and her mom's like what'd you say what what'd you do she was always ashamed because her chinese half is the non-muslim half her muslim half of the family is you know because her mom's a chinese convert and you know the muslim half is you know chum I'm like, I speak from the heart to all of my students. Their self-esteem is important. Their self-determination is important. And also, Sumeya, um, I told her because uh, people from the Muslim community, they always, you know, if you're a convert, they try to give you a new name. I had two students named Sumeya. And, um, Sumeya is the name of the first murder of Islam, the first person to be killed for their faith. And it was a woman, black woman. Uh, and it's so funny because if you say that to Muslims, if you call her black, they get offended, but they know she was black. She was black, her husband was Arab and her kid was a half seas, mixed. And um, we went over the story of Sumeya. Um, and I didn't get graphic because the story of Sumeya is that uh, when she was killed for her faith, uh, a man took a spear through her private parts, through her private parts until it came up out of her mouth. That's how she died. And he did it in front of her husband and her, her uh, biracial son. So I didn't go there. But the point was, we are Sumeyas. We're, we're brave. It's the blessing of the name that you were given. That you are never going to be a coward. And if you have ever seen this little girl, I mean, she's just the dopest, sporty, pretty, smart, eyebrow raising, swagged out, like, amazing. But I had never... I had never seen her so scared before. And I I did what I felt like I, I um, was supposed to do. And her mom was impressed with me, but I wasn't impressed with me. I'm like, I'm her teacher. I'm like her second parent. But again, I say... I can't tell you that I know of any actually I had a white French professor who uh, immigrated to America and found out she was white and when she found out she was white she was horrified and she ended up mixing with black people 
and she, uh, I guess there's always one, that one teacher in the life of a child. So that's my long story short. So I was the French teacher who kept saying Papa Ligba over and over and over and over again until now. That's to say, uh, she struck an ancestral uh, vein in my body. <sighs> that has a lot to do with um, Papa Ligba. Um, but in general, it doesn't happen the other way around. So when you send your little black kids to these schools and out in these neighborhoods and like, I mean, even, even black people are anti-black. Let's talk about that. Even black people are anti-black. They want to be light-skinned. They want to be mixed. They... Uh, it's a colonial hangover of white supremacy that we all have to fork out of ourselves and be honest about. I got into it uh, on TikTok with this little Mexican guy who was just like, um, mad at African-American people for burning sage because only Native Americans are supposed to do that. And I was just like, do you know what African-Americans were called? But I was like, you know, on my, uh, I was born in the eighties. The word African-American didn't exist. Do you want to know what we were called? Before we were called colors, coloreds, before we were called Negroes, before we were called slaves. Do you want to know what we were called? Do you want to know what we were called? Aborigines. I said, some of us were brought over here some of us were already here. A lot of us were already here. So I started to talk about indigenous heritage and I remember my second graders had uh, this song about the mom. Um, you know, you are the number one for me. Mm, Maher, Maher Zane is the name of the artist. I can tag him or I can put the video in the, in the thing, but they were like, you know, you are the number one Choctaw because they didn't, you know, How do I say this? African American didn't catch the beat of the song, and um, African American was didn't fit the pocket of the beat of the song, and neither did Black. But they remembered that I was Indigenous, right? And because they're second graders, you know, of course, you know, they're they're impressionable. So when they would sing to me, that was it. So the the number one for me is a song about your mom, right? So it's, it's a guy singing about how he grew up and how he's going to take care of his mom and blah, blah, blah. And so they sang the song to me. And it was Abdurrahman who was like the first person to start it. Like, you know, you are the number one Choctaw. So, you know, I'm, I'm on this TikTok and telling these people, you know, my grandmother, my great, great grandmother was this Choctaw slave owned by Irish people and blue, 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 blue. And, you know, they're just so offended at the thought of an indigenous person being black, I'm like, you better Google an old Hawaiian queen and sit down. You better Google ancient Aztec people and what they look like and how they have this here hook nose and sit down with it. Oh, well, just because they had dark skin doesn't mean that they were black. Well, how about my hair texture? Because that's what Aztecs have. Have you ever seen an Olmec colossal head, little kid? You teenager, what do you know? If you don't come sit down in my class. And he was just angry. And I'm just like, you know what you're angry at? You have in your heart. Passed down in your culture, anti-blackness. You have things in your heart that make your heart a match for the colonizer. And until you get rid of it. Your ancestors legacy is your... You've made your ancestors' legacy tinged with that of the colonizer because look at you, look at how you came out. I shouldn't have to tell you what a more is if you really know your history. I remember I was a caregiver for a while and I was looking after a woman from the Puyallup uh, Nation tribe. And uh, we were alone in her home, obviously. And it's really intimate because I'm wiping her booty, right? 
And um, we were talking about a bunch of different people and tribes and nations and Native American contributions and things that people don't know that, you know, they came up with. And so I let it spill out, you know, that I was Choctaw and Chickasaw. And she looked at me like, you want a cookie? She wasn't offended. She didn't deny my heritage. She was just like, all the remaining Choctaw are black. So when you go look at the website and it's a blonde, blue eyed, pale skinned dude who needs sunscreen, I'm like, it ain't a, it ain't an OG Choctaw that ever needed no SPF one, two, three, four, 10,000. Ain't one. But you get to talk about that copper colored Amor Eakin, and then they say you're the only one who's colored like copper. They call you all kind of liars and culture vultures and delusional to the point where you don't even want to talk about it anymore. But I'm like, before they called us any of this stuff, they called us Aborigines. And we've been here and we've been black because when Columbus, if you read his diary entries and the letters he sent back to the Queen of Spain, he's like, oh, I think I found Ethiopians here. He didn't just call the people Indians. He's like, is it Habishas and these be like, why these they, these big, black, curly haired, woolly haired, thick lipped. I mean, they out here, the way he described them dances. And I was like, I know exactly what that rain dance is. He's, this was crip walking, kicking up dust. <laughs> and then there's, um, Nelly has a song, Drop Down, The Chili Long Girl, and I'm doing it in my seat. Um, let me stop. But um, you can see that eagle dance where women make their legs flap while they're like basically on their toes. Um, it's like a squat. And you can see the description of it in some of these letters that were written back to Spain. And it was Moorish Spain for like 600 years. What, what, what do you know? And so... When you hear that black Muslims sailed the ocean blue way before 1492, and that, you know, Columbus's boat was one of the last to leave, and not the first to discover anything, how does that make you feel? You get mad because those people are black. Get mad. They get really mad because they're really anti black. It's a really deep rooted thing. Some people, their self esteem, Part of their self-esteem is contingent upon how distant they are from blackness. Wrapping up here, that little boy's life means nothing to the man who shot him and the people in the community of the man who shot him. Dad, shoot him. That's what you're supposed to do. I don't know if anybody told you, but, um, you don't just go to church and pray and cry. If you're reading all these books, all these Qur'ans and Bibles and things, God talks about punishing people through your hands. I'm just saying. I tell you what, I ain't gonna make it. You shoot my niece, I ain't gonna make it. You shoot any one of my nephews, I ain't gonna make it. I'm not going to make it out alive. Not at all. I have to not cuss. I have to not say bad words. I'm not going to make it out alive, which is fine because if you, 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 shot my, you shot my kid. You already killed me anyway. I'm already dead. The least I could do is avenge them so that they live and know that they're important enough to be protected. Do something about that Vietnamese man.